Today's message, or the aim of this message today is to show us the privilege that we have to be a part of the kingdom of God in the earth. I hope you walk away today saying to yourself, my, I am privileged to be saved. You know, salvation and serving the Lord now almost get, gets too much negative press to me from saints. We love to talk about uh, being hurt in the church and church hurt and our haters and all that kind of stuff. You would think, uh, if you listen today, that there are people who are just not happy in Jesus. But I want to I wanna relay to you today, you are privileged. We are privileged to be a part of the church, to be a part of of God's work in the earth. Not too long ago, I watched the inductions uh, into the NFL Hall of Fame. That's a man-made hall. That's a man-made honor. It has no eternal merit whatsoever. It has no real power. And yet those men are proud to be called Hall of Famers. Today I pray that you are proud to be called a saint of God. This message should cause us to work harder, to be more grateful to the Lord for, our, for the role that he has afforded us by allowing us to serve in his church, to serve in his kingdom. We are privileged today to be saved. We are privileged indeed. This message would help, will help us realize why we were selected by God in the first place. And yes, we were selected. Amen. Now I'm not preaching Calvinism. I'm not saying that uh, you were born to be saved and someone else was born not to be saved. Now we do know that the Lord wants everybody to be saved. The Bible says who would that no man should perish. Matter of fact, the main reason why Jesus hadn't come back yet is that he's long suffering, giving all of us time to get right. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his, his promises as some men count slackness, but he is long suffering. Toward us. Why haven't you come, Lord? Not willing that any should perish. I'm so glad the Lord didn't come back in 1976. For had he come in 76, I would have missed it. And some of you are glad that God didn't come back in 2017. For had he come back in 2017, you would have missed it. Amen. So uh, even though I say, even so come, Lord Jesus, I'm glad that just as he waited for me, I'm glad that he's waiting for others. Praise the Lord. But he has uh, uh, selected us. As Jesus said in John 15 and 16, he said to his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That is, I appointed you. I, I arranged you. The, the word ordained there is almost like arranging food on a table. It says, I arranged you that you should bring forth more fruit. And we know that when Jesus, when we read at how it played out, Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. And when Peter met him, they went and uh, they, they would pass the word and give the word to others. But at the same time, the initiator was the Lord. You didn't approach Jesus for salvation before Jesus approached you to give you salvation. See, we, we, all of us who are saved, we're saved because we responded favorably to his choice of us. Praise the Lord. So, well, Pastor, I love the Lord. I'll tell you why you love him. I know the main reason you love the Lord. Now, you can name a lot of reasons, but I know the main reason you love him. The main reason you love him is the main reason I love him. The Bible tells us we love him 
We love him because he first loved us. That's the main reason. Now, there are other things about him. I love him because he saved me, he raised me, brought me, taught me. All that, we can go through all that. But the main reason we love the Lord is because the Lord loved us first. Every one of us who are saved are saved because the Holy Spirit of God tugged at our hearts and we responded favorably. Now, I will say this, for those of you in here today or who are watching, who are streaming, however you are hearing this, if you haven't gotten saved yet, it is not because God the Holy Spirit have not tugged at your heart. Amen. It's not because he hasn't reached for you. It's that you have not responded the right way. The Bible says today, while it is still called today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The voice of God is the voice of the preacher. The voice of God is the voice of that person who is witnessing to you. The voice of God is that pamphlet that you're reading that, that shows you the way of salvation. The voice of God is that good Christian uh, record that, that, that is telling you how to be saved. The Lord comes in many ways. And at the end, we, we know who's chosen and we know who, we know who make it uh, by the condition that they're in by the time they leave here. You can't look at one person and say, God chose this one, but God didn't choose that one. Only the Lord knows. Amen. But he, 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 Christ is for every man. Jesus told his disciples, who, who told him after many walked away from him, they said, Lord, we're not going to leave you. He looked at them and says, I've chosen every one of you, and yet one of you is a devil. Isn't that something? How many are glad that the Lord reached out for you? Reached out to you that Jesus made the first move. Amen. In your love relationship with Christ, he made the first move. This message will show that we were not selected because we were the most qualified. He didn't save us because we were the most qualified. In fact, in most of our cases, just the opposite is true. Amen. So we will walk uh, in our God-ordained humility as he uh, qualifies us to do the Lord's work. See, we weren't qualified, and if you realize that you weren't qualified, then you walk in humility as the Lord qualifies you to do the work of the Lord. Kind of reminds me of what God told David um, through the prophet uh, Nathan. He said to King David, he said, while you were uh, keeping your, uh, you out there in your father's pasture, working in the sheep goat, that is, you were working in the pasture, he said, I, I took you from following the sheep to be ruler over my people. You were a shepherd. I chose you. And I made you king of Israel. God said to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7. He says, I did not choose you because you were the greatest. He said, in fact, you were the least. Amen. See, it's amazing how the Lord chooses people. It's amazing who the Lord chooses. So let's look at this and and we're going to try to preach to you a little bit and see what God has to say. Let's look at this contextually. The first thing after Paul gives greetings and gives thanks, saints, the apostle addresses some divisions that were in the church. It's, it's so important that we be of one mind. He says to the saints at Corinth in chapter 1, verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which is of the house of Chloe, 
that there are contentions among you. There's strife in the church. There's contentions among you. Now, I, now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Paul says, is Christ divided? Some of you are identifying with Paul. Some of you are identifying with Cephas. Some of you are identifying with Apollos. The church is divided. He says, is Christ divided? Saints, you shouldn't let anybody own you in the church. You're a part of the church, but you can't say amen unless your buddies say amen. Amen. You can't get with what's being preached unless your group gets with that. Oh, you shouldn't give anybody that kind of power. I don't think you should give your parents that kind of power. Some of you, you shout if your daddy shout. You, you, you praise the Lord if your mama praise the Lord. You get happy if your friends get happy. Your relationship with Christ has to be an individual one. See, I'm glad to see a husband and wife come to church together. But wife, you ought not to come to church if your husband don't. Yeah, I mean, if your husband stay home, you shouldn't stay home. Husband, if your wife, well, my wife wasn't feeling well, so the whole family got to stay home. Say, so, well, she got a bad cold. Everybody got to stay. The, the dog got to stay. The boys, the girls, everybody. But, uh, well, uh, he's working today. Well, why aren't you at church? Is Christ divided? See, this thing is a collective effort, but it's an individual one. Amen. Amen. If I stop serving the Lord, there's zero chance of that happening. But if I stop serving the Lord, I pray that my wife keeps serving. Because uh, hell lasts forever. And you, you, you've got to know the Lord for yourself. Amen. Because you know what happened? People die. Oh, well, we're a long way from that. Perfectly healthy looking people drop dead. Praise the Lord. And you have to, you, you got to have something in you. People backslide. People leave the church. People, people decide that they ain't going to serve the Lord no more. Well, you ought not to let their decision to not serve cause you to not serve. The church at Corinth, when the church is divided, the church doesn't have the power that it should have. See, one of the things that we got to work on keeping up is too much, in, in many cases, too much commotion. It throws you. Too many things that can break your concentration. And so when you're trying to cast out devils or you're praying for the sick or you're trying to get people uh, delivered, um, uh, too, many, too many things, like them, them, they, they keep adjusting this mic. Uh, Y'all better, you need to leave that alone because you, you change it too much. Don't touch anything else for a while. Amen. Thank you. Give them a big hand. They're the best. Now, they're the best workers in the world. And they have the hardest job. Because you wouldn't want that job. You wouldn't want that job. Amen. And they just tough. Thank you, Cone. Thank you, preacher. But we want to be with one accord. Amen. Amen. The Bible teaches that we should mind the same things and walk according to the same rule. And see, they were even being divided on baptisms. So Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. But Crispus and Gaius. Uh, lest any of you should say I am baptized, that I had baptized in my own name. So he urges the church to be with one accord. Are you with me? He speaks to them about that and says, now we've got to do something about this, uh, uh, the, the, the division that's in us. And then he gets to a very, very important point. And I want you to hear this. Paul defends his method or manner of communicating his message. In fact, he defends his manner and his message. He says in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross. The preaching of the cross is to them that 
perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Somebody say the preaching of the cross. This word preaching uh, comes from a Greek word that says, that literally means to speak, but it's not just to make noise, but it is to, to communicate uh, certain intelligence. It is a word as, it, it is the expression of intelligence. It is not random talk, nor is it to speak without necessarily saying anything intelligent. But preaching is communicating uh, certain information about Christ. If it's not about Christ, it's not preaching. If it's not biblically based, it's not preaching. Many preachers no longer preach the Bible. They stand behind podiums. They put on suits, some. Uh, they, they, they have a Bible, but many times... You don't hear the Bible. What you hear is a series of anecdotal stories. They talk about this man, a man they met, and, and someone who did this and someone who did that. Well, if what is being communicated is not Bible, then it is not preaching. For the intelligence, for it to be preaching, the intelligence that, that is being communicated has to be the Word of God. So Paul says the preaching of the cross. And we're going to deal with that in just a minute. But I'm, I'm, I want to show you something. In verse 21, he says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, but it pleased God. Here it, here it is again. Through the foolishness of preaching. And this is yet another Greek word, which means to discharge uh, a herald's office. To cry out, to proclaim, to, and, and this word deals with the, the method, the act of preaching. And then in verse 23, uh, it says, but we preach Christ. That is, we announce Christ. We scream extra, extra, read all about it while talking about Christ. So Paul's manner and many in Corinth had a problem with his manner. And you have to admit, today people have problems with preachers. Even preachers have problems with preaching. Many preachers now will stand up and tell you, I didn't come to preach uh, to you. Well, if you didn't come to preach to me, I got to go. Because when I, when I attend church, I come to church to hear preaching. I hear the word, come to hear the word preach, and I come to hear the word talk. I don't, I, listen, I didn't come today to share with you. I came to preach to you. I, I, don't, I don't like how we're interjecting terms that shouldn't be interjected. Paul wasn't a, a sharer. He was a preacher. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and, and, and there were people in Corinth who had a problem with him standing up, speaking out loud. Screaming his message. Praise the Lord. They didn't like it. He says, for the preaching, they hated his manner and many hated his message. His message was the cross. The cross. So you see in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. Paul's heraldry. His standing and preaching the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, I want you to hear me now. You got to get this. The cross is the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The message of the cross is that salvation cannot be obtained by anyone except Jesus Christ. The cross is the life and times of Jesus Christ. The cross is a message concerning what Jesus did for us on the cross. And all corresponding uh, messages and teachings that line up with the scriptures. So if you're preaching Genesis through Revelations, you, you can qualify that as preaching the cross because you're preaching the Bible. The Old Testament points toward the cross. The New Testament points 
the New Testament, the Gospels point at the cross and the epistles point back to the cross. It's all about the cross, what Jesus did. So Paul says, my style is that of a herald, but my message is that of the cross. Many have a problem with the message. I told you the other day, the Lord spoke to me and said, even in our fight for the lives of the unborn, that there are many people who share our passion for the unborn who are in this fight, but they don't share our passion for preaching. So many times they don't preach because they don't share that passion. But to the preacher, preaching is the answer to everything. Praise Lord. We, we preach while we fry eggs. Preach while you polish your shoes. Preaching, preaching. Preachers preach. And I, and I pray, preachers, that you haven't lost your preaching passion. Praise the Lord. If, and here's how you know you may be slipping away. You, uh, a, a preacher uh, preaches uh, when there's nobody to preach to. When you're home in your house. So, uh, well, they hadn't put me up at a, in a long time at the church. Well, you ought to be preaching to the mattress. I preach to everything. I preach to the lights. I preach to my toothbrush. I preach. I, oh, ask Pam. She'll tell you. I walk around preaching. Preach, 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 preach. Because that's what we do. Praise the Lord. And then when they put me up, uh, now I'm going to preach some more. Praise the Lord. And, and uh, I, I preach my sermons before I preach them. I dream about them. Preaching. The, 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 not just the content, but the method. When we are at Drake Circle, we preach. We are, we stand there. And many have problems with our standing there, engaging, talking through the fence, screaming to the top of our voice, playing the role of the herald. The message is Christ. Come out. Let that baby live. Jesus died for your baby. Jesus died for your sins. People in the LGBTQ community despise the office of the herald. When the herald stands up and tells them, come out of that death style. Jesus died for you to be delivered from living like that. And when you stand there like a herald and you preach the gospel, you're called judgmental, uncaring, harsh. That's what they said about Paul as he walked in the office of a herald. I've had some of you say, well, you know, Pastor, I got a calling on my life. I feel the Lord called me, but I, I really am not for all that preaching. He hadn't called you. He hadn't called you. To you. Praise the Lord. When, when he calls you, this thing, this thing gets in you like a burning fire. Shut up in your bones. Jeremiah got hurt and said, I'm not going to preach any more. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to say anything else in his name. He said, but his word was in my heart. As a fire shut up in my bone. And he said, I got weary with forbearing. And I could not stay. When the Lord calls you. When the Lord calls you to the ministry of the herald. The herald look for opportunities to share. Look around and see if you see somebody who look like they're not saved. There you go. Inching your way over to them. Hey, it might, it might start out with, did you see the game? See that pass? That, yeah, that pass remind me of the way prayer works. When, 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 when it's in you. Oh my. And as the years roll on, the fire does not wane. As the years pass. Oh, I, I long for those days. Uh, preachers, now look, 
You ought to take advantage of this time when, when you get a chance to preach. All you got to do is show up and preach. You ain't got 10,000 problems to solve, all kinds of things. Before you get a chance, you better preach. Because when God saddles you with responsibility, if you know, people think, well, the pastor, you just get locked away until it's time. You don't get that luxury when you're, on, uh, when you're in charge. There's so many other things. So you, your, your uh, ability to concentrate has to be magnified because you don't get that. You, because the devil is always, there's something that's always going on. Amen. Paul said, besides all these things, the care of the churches that come upon me daily, it's a heavy load. But nothing puts out that fire. Good God Almighty. So Paul says, they got a problem with me. The world, the world has a problem with preachers. Amen. Everybody's got a problem with preachers who preach. Some preachers now have problems with preachers. Some of these, some of these, some of these new, new, new style. Uh, these Sunday school teachers and they make fun of us and there you go giving up your anointing giving up your fire throwing away your tie undoing your shirt walking around sounding like Dr. Phil trying to call yourself a life coach trying to sound modern let me tell you something God hadn't called us to modernity you know what the test of true preaching is? The test of true preaching is how close are we in our preaching to the apostles? How close are we in our preaching to what Jesus preached? See, everybody telling us how to change the church. The test of the church is not the, the, the ability to change the church. The test of the church is the church's ability to remain the same. The Bible didn't say that God's truth changed to all generations. The Bible says God's truth endures all generations. Fads come and go, but the truth of God. Don't get me started. The truth of God remains the same. Mother Turner, I'm not trying to get away from the way Elder Turner did it. I want to stay as close as I can. Because when you drift and you drift and you drift, after a while, we're not a hole in this church. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not going, we're not, we're not, this is not, we're not getting ready to get dark. Turn the lights down low. Uh, spray paint the ceiling black. Get rid of the cross or have the cross so decorated that you don't know it's a cross and, uh, and all that stuff. No, sir. I'm trying to stay as close as close to what I heard because what I heard 41 years ago set my soul on fire and I've been on fire ever since. And the old time religion, if it was good enough for mother, it's good enough for me. Somebody say something here. See, it, it, you know, I understood better when I began to read this. I'm not the only preacher who run into folk who have problems with preaching. Problems with the style of the herald. And I'm not going to let you talk me out of it either. I'm not giving that up. Paul didn't give it up. Paul said, I acknowledge something. For the preaching of the cross is for them that perish. Number one, he accepts that there will be losses. Not everybody's going to hear this and be glad to hear it. Not everybody's going to hear this and accept it. They are in the crowd of the loss. They are those, that, those who perish. He said, for those who are perishing, it's foolishness. There's, there's something in that. Something in that. There's a reason, one of the reasons that is foolishness to them is that because their attitude toward God is wrong, he won't let them see the wisdom in it. See, many people who are lost, they ain't lost because the devil blinded them. They're lost because God blinded them. 
Is that not what he did in Isaiah? Read Isaiah 6. God blinded. Because they heard so much, but they wouldn't listen. See, after a point, after a point, if you just, if you just rather have Oprah than Jesus, after a point, Jesus says, okay, you can have it. And from that point on, the Bible doesn't make sense to you. To that point on, whatever we do, whatever, however we shout, is silly to you. And it's going to be silly because he has turned you over to yourself. So it's foolishness to you. Yeah, the way they do over that upper room, they're so backwards, they're so silly, or they're so caught up in tradition. It doesn't make sense. Are you still over that? God has given that person up. They can't even recognize a move of God when they see one. They don't feel the Holy Ghost anymore. They are in a perishing situation. And for people who do not see, guess what? They don't see. So because they don't see it, it's foolishness to them. It's not foolishness. It's foolishness to them. Hallelujah. To them. Praise God. There's a whole lot of things about holiness that I thought was foolishness until I got saved. And then when, when I came to the light, instead of rejecting the light, I embraced the light. And guess what? It makes so much sense to me. But had I rejected it, oh, I'd look at it today and I'd be saying what some of you say. Service lasts so long. He preached oh, too long. Choir sings too long. The game starts in a few minutes. It doesn't even make any sense to, to carry on the way they carry on. What? Starting a, a, a women's convention next week. This stuff don't make any sense. And you know what's sad about what they're saying? They're not being mean. It actually doesn't make sense to them anymore. Because they're perishing. See, when, when the things of God don't make sense, you, you might better check yourself. Because the problem is not the things of God. It's that something's going wrong in you. Paul said, let me preach this. Let, let me move out because uh, 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 you don't follow me. He says here, for the, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us, how many are in this us today? He says, but to us, which are saved. It's not foolishness at all. It is the power of God for salvation. The, for those of us who have tasted, how I many have tasted? The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, notice that even that, that's a command. Taste and see that he's good. That's not trying to see if you like it. No, 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 taste and see that he is good. If you taste him, if you taste him, he's good. There ain't no, ain't nobody's tasted Jesus. I don't like the taste. If you taste it, he's good. How many have tasted it? I've tasted him, and the word is sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. God Almighty, somebody better come get me. It's something about living this life and being saved and being in the church. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. No, sir. Ah, look at this groan I wouldn't, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing, will bring to naught, I will frustrate the understanding of the prudent. That is, when a man, I don't care if he's a scholar, he can be a mathematician, he can be a scientist, scientist. He can work on the human genome. He can be as brilliant as Einstein. But if he rejects the gospel, if he rejects Christ for salvation, whatever he turns to, it will let him down. It will frustrate him because can't nobody save you but Jesus Christ. If you don't come in this way, there is no other way. And all other ways will frustrate you. Oh, oh, my heart goes out to Hollywood. 
had them stupid shows to give them. They're the best in the world at patting each other on the back, telling each other how wonderful they are. They know they're living godless lives. They know they're wicked. And oh, they reject the gospel. And they, they try to hide behind the little Emmy and the Oscar and all that. All of them dope drinking, run around each other's wives uh, of half the... Most of the actors will sleep with a man, a woman, a dog, a cat. They'll do anything to get them roles. And they try to, you know, they, they walk around like they're all of that. But listen, there's only one way to salvation. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God says, I will, I will frustrate the wisdom of the wise. Hallelujah. And I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And, and listen to God. God takes on the, the role of a lawyer. God says, where is the wife? Now Paul is in a courtroom now. The, whole, the Holy Ghost and got on him. He's feeling, where is the wife? Where is the scribe? Where is the scholar? Get one. Get these brainiacs. Who can put, who claim to be able to produce another way of salvation? Get the secular psychologists. Oh, get them yoga folk. Get them, get them. Bring them, bring them all, bring them all. Where is the wife? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? All of those who master in human philosophies. Get them. Get them. Come on. Boy, I love this stuff. So I like, I like offensive Christianity. Wow. Oh, this, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it. The devil will beat me up. I'm having such a hard time. I, I don't have much patience for that. And the devil beat on me probably more than he does you. Pastor, you don't, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I go through. Don't nobody know what anyone goes through. But I know this, I know this, God's a keeper. He's a way maker. He's a company keeper in a lonely hour. Come on. Get them all, get them all, get them all, get them all. Bring, bring the wives, bring, bring Mark Zuckerberg. Bring the, the, uh, the CEO of Twitter. Get Gates, get them all, bring them, bring them. Bring them, bring them, bring, come on. See, let me tell you something. God's got it all in control. He said, bring them. Uh-huh. And he says, where's the wise describe the dispute of the world? Hath not God made foolishness? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world for salvation? You can't get salvation from anyone else. He says, he says here, for after that, in the wisdom of God. For since the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You can't come up with a man-made way to Jesus. You can't come up, hey Muslims, uh, uh, black Muslims, green Muslims, woke, black lives matter, all of them. None of these things work for salvation. You can walk around and call yourself a 5%, a 2%, a 3%, or whatever. You will end up frustrated. These, these fads, they don't last long. They don't last long. Notice, fads come and go. Christianity remains the same. Fads come and go. Hey Amen. I told somebody the other day, yeah, I'm in the Church of God of Christ. Let's see how many of these independent churches, you know, they oh, ain't, God ain't using nobody but them now. Let's see how many of them will be around. 110 years from now. We're getting ready to go into our 111th convocation. If God watches over the church for 111 years. Let's see. I don't care how brilliant he or she may be right now. Let's see. 111 years from now. Let's see. If it will even be in existence. No, more than likely, as soon as that charismatic leader dies, that's the end of it. The candlestick is removed. Praise the Lord. But when you're in the move of God, God takes down one, raises up another, takes down one, raises up another. God took down Dad Mason, raised up another leader, and, and, and the beat goes on. I'm going to preach in just a minute here. 
I feel, I feel like taking off. But I heard him. He said, uh, the world by wisdom knew not God, but it pleased God. See, Paul is defending his method. It pleased God. Yes, sir. By the foolishness. I know what I'm doing seems absurd. How I lift my voice and go up and down. I know that, praise the Lord, all of these gestures. So I'm standing here sweating on television. I know that I would, the world would probably like me better if I was just a little more subdued. Yes, sir. And a little more calm and just, just a little more soft and tell them, you know, I didn't come to do nothing but help you live your little best life. And uh, I didn't come to do nothing but encourage you. Praise the Lord. No, no, no. God chose the foolishness of being a herald. God chose the foolishness of preaching. He admits, Paul says, call it what you want Call my style what you want to. You call it foolishness? Okay. It'll be foolishness then. But it's still God's method. The most, the, most, the, the most powerful form of soul winning is preaching. The most powerful way of it in prayer of getting the devil the, 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 the back up. I'm talking about in public warfare is preaching. Praise the Lord. There's nothing like preaching. Preach. Preach every chance you get. Preach. Tell them about Jesus. God chose the foolishness of preaching mm -hmm, to save them that believe. Then Paul said, now I admit that we have a little problem here. He says the Jews require a sign. You know, the Jews didn't like the message of a crucified Messiah. The Jews uh, viewed that as a stumbling block for two reasons. Number one, they killed him. And number two, they'd read in Isaiah chapter 35 and Isaiah chapter 61, they read, praise the Lord, about the, the conquering Messiah. So they had a problem with this crucified Messiah. So for the Jews, amen, uh, the sign they were looking for, a conquering Messiah, and says Jews want signs and Greeks want wisdom. That is, the Greeks were intellectuals. The Greeks loved uh, human knowledge. They loved flowery speech. They loved, praise the Lord, human wisdom. Says, so the Jews want a sign and the Greeks want wisdom. He says, but we don't cater to them. You catering preachers, seeker friendly. Paul says, we don't give signs. And we don't cater to your wisdom. We Preach Christ crucified. I know what you want, but I'm not going to give you what you want. See, y'all, we're changing it now. We're changing it now. We're preaching a, word, a, a gospel that the world likes. Oh, we're changing it now. Amen. Take that edge off, preacher. We're changing now. Calm down, Rev. Amen. Mix a little psychology. Mix a little worldliness. Mix the, the colloquialisms of the world in your preaching. We're changing now. You know, millennials don't like that. Generation Xers don't like that. This. Uh, the, uh, this group don't like all these groups. So we're twi we, well, you're almost twisted in a pretzel trying to give this group a sign Give this group wisdom. Cater to that group over there. Paul said, no. We preach Christ crucified. The Jews didn't want Christ crucified. The Greeks didn't want Christ crucified. So Paul, what do you preach? He said, we preach Christ crucified. Somebody give God praises. Bring me up a little bit here. Give, give God praise. See, we, we can't, look, we can't, upper room don't claim. Listen, we don't claim to be all things for all people. Come over, come over in our church. We, we, got, we got a little something for everybody. No, we have Christ crucified. Now, 
praise the Lord, we're going to tell you about Jesus. Oh, come on over to our church. Regards to who you worship, you'll be comfortable because we just believe all of God's people are the same and just come on over. Well, go on over there. But if you come over here, you're going to hear about one God, one faith, and one baptism. And about the one Christ who died on the cross and rose again the third day. He said we preach, regardless of what they want, we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, they consider it foolishness. See, the Gentiles had no messianic expectation. The whole message to the Gentiles of somebody dying on the cross was absurdity. The Gentiles would listen and laugh at the message. And there was nothing in it for them. And many times the Gentiles would say, what? You want us to hope in someone who couldn't even save themselves? No, sir, we will turn to our wisdom. And this is the kind of hostility that the gospel was met with. But Paul said, nonetheless, we're going to preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to the Jews. Praise the Lord. The, uh, absurd to the uh, Gentiles. But to them that are saved, to them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, they discover that Christ is the power of God and Christ is the wisdom of God. You see, you can't see this thing until you get in it. There may be someone here today who is not saved and you may feel about the church all of the negative things that I've just said. But if you ever let Jesus save you, if you ever let Jesus come into your life, all of a sudden your eyes will come open and you will jump up yourself and say, can't nobody do me like Jesus, but you got to be in Christ to be able to see this thing. Can I get a witness here? He said, Paul said, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Do you know what he was referencing when he was talking about the foolishness of God? He was talking about the message of the cross and he was talking about preaching because the Corinthians called it foolish. He said, you may call it foolish, but it's wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He said, now why did he mention weakness? He mentioned weakness because in the early days of Christianity, the message wasn't too attractive to the nobles. It wasn't too attractive to the high ups. It wasn't too attractive to the intellectuals. And the church looked around and noticed that most of the people who were getting saved, they weren't scholars. They weren't billionaires. They weren't, praise the Lord, famous. They weren't intellectuals. They were just common people filled with the Holy Ghost. So Paul jumped on it and he said, for you notice in your calling, brethren, that not many wise men, not many noble men, not many great men after the flesh are called. He said, you don't see them but one of the reasons that you don't see them is because God hasn't chosen them. Some of you wonder why. Uh, you look at the professional athletes. You look at the ones that the world loves. And you notice that most of them aren't saved. And you wonder why don't they come to Christ. And we, we think we consider everything except maybe God leaped over them. Because the problem with some of the super achievers, they get saved acting like they've done the Lord a favor. They get saved behaving as though you ought to be glad I'm in the church. Don't you know who I am? Well, the Lord don't reach out to people who view themselves that way. Because the truth is we're nothing. Hallelujah. He said, but instead of God choosing the nobles, See, notice what he said. He said, not many, not many wise men, not many mighty men, not many noble men after the flesh 
are even called. That is, he skips them because their mind is not right. Not that he don't plan to double back, but they think that they are something. Oh, I know the Lord wants me to be saved because I have this education. I've been to Harvard and Yale. I've been to every Ivy League school there is. Brown University. Oh, I, I'm a catch. Well, when you think that way about yourself, the Lord passes you by. He passes you by because Jesus is not looking for the person who think that they're a catch. I'll tell you who he's looking for. He's looking for the ones who fall in the category of the fools. He said, God have chosen. I'm talking, I'm preaching chosen by God. God have chosen the foolish things. Well now, who are the foolish? The foolish are those who have no more sense than to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're the foolish ones of this world. They're the people who believe what the world called a nothing message. That's what the world called Christianity. That the gospel was a nothing message. A message about a man dying on the cross, living a sinless life and dying on the cross. And don't even throw in being born of a virgin. Who in the world believes that? It's a nothing message. Well, for the people who grab hold to it, the world calls them foolish. Paul says, well, God called the foolish. Do I have any foolish in here who can say, preacher, I believe this nothing message. I'm part of the foolish. But notice what he chose the foolish to do. He chose the foolish to confound the wise. That is, God is going to use the foolish to put to shame the wise of this world. You're too wise to accept Jesus. Well, Jesus is going to use that foolish person who accepted him to put the wise to shame. And he says, yeah, God have chosen the weak. Who are the weak? The weak are those who are socially powerless. They have no political power. They have no money. They have no education. But they were wise enough to accept Jesus and Jesus will take a person who has nothing going for him and raise that man up and use that person to put to shame the rich and powerful, the well-connected and the affluent. Can I get a witness here? Not only did God shun the noble, but he chose the, those who are base, the base things of this world, deal with those of low birth. You come from a poor family, born out of wedlock. Mama wasn't anybody. Daddy wasn't anything. Hallelujah. Come from humble beginnings. Praise the Lord. You ended up in an orphanage. Your parents didn't even want you. Thank you, Jesus. You are a good candidate for the work of the Lord. Mama tried to abort you. Daddy left when you were small. Family threw you away. Your family and for, but you were, or either that or you were born in a family where everybody were crooks, cussing, fighting, throwing liquor balls at each other, cussing each other out, stabbing one another. The police lived at your house. Somebody's going to jail all the time. You're a good candidate. Do I have anybody in here of low birth? Say, preacher, I didn't come from a wonderful situation. Let me see you wave your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. These are the people the Lord chose. Then he talked about the despise. That is, once despised, always despised. The world hated you before you got saved. And they can't stand you now. And you're trapped in a despised situation. Somebody know your past. They know how you messed up. They know about your marriages that failed. They know about the abortions that you had. Oh, they know that you went to jail. They know that you did something wrong and they hold that against you. Well, those of us uh, who are in the despised category, you're a good candidate 
for God to use you. Lift your hands and tell God, thank you. Mm, mm, mm. I'm almost done. And uh, then there's another group that he calls the things that be not. Now this is really, you know, I feel like I fit in all the categories. All of them are me. Uh, but I'm really in this one. Uh, the Jews often refer to the Gentiles as things that be not. You see, to the Greeks, nothing was more important than being, existing, mattering. When he speak of things that be not, they're speaking of people to whom other people call nobodies, to whom other people call nothings. Look at you and say, you're nothing. You're a nobody. Well, God looks for nothing. God, Jesus, looks for nobody. Since the world calls you nothing. The world says you need to get a life. You're nobody. Your mama wasn't anything. And your daddy wasn't anything. You're nobody. You've done nothing. You've achieved nothing. You, you are, uh, you know, life as an African-American male, I'm accustomed to people being afraid of me who have no reason to fear. I'm accustomed to white women when they see me grabbing their purse. I'm accustomed, I, I was getting gas yesterday and I just studied a little bit about nothings and I was filling up and a lady saw me, she walked all the way around as though I was to be avoided like the plague. I went in the store to make her purchase. And God so had it that as she was coming out the store, I was going in the store. And I held the door for her. And I smiled at her. L lift me up on the monitor, brother preacher. I smiled at her. And it didn't break the ice, she was still scared. She walked past me like I was gonna snatch her purse. She walked past me. She appeared to be in her 60s or 70s. Like I was gonna try to rape her or something. In her eyes, I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. But that's all right. When Jesus died on the cross, he had nobodies in mind. He had nothings in mind. Do I have anybody in here who can say, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. But look at what Jesus is doing. He's taking this nobody and, and using this nobody to bring to naught the very things that the world values. He'll take a person of low degree and raise you up and use you to change society. Why does God do this? Let me close. Why does he do it? The Bible says he does this, that no flesh will glory in his sight. What's my point? If you know that you didn't have anything going for you, if you know that you were on your way to hell, if you know that you didn't come from anywhere special, and then the Lord takes you and raises you up, and make somebody out of you. You ought to be glad to work, glad to serve, glad to be saved, glad to preach, glad to pray, glad to sing, glad to run, glad to jump, because you know that you had nothing going for you until you heard the word of the Lord, until Jesus saved you. So you know that where you are, you're not where you are because you had the credentials. You're not where you are because you were so smart, but you're where you are because God's been so good. And when you glory, you don't glory in your resume. You don't glory in your accomplishments, but you glory in the Lord. Wow! Somebody here ought to give God glory for where he brought you from. Give him glory for how he brought you out. I was headed nowhere fast. I 
was sinking, but the Lord. Somebody praise him in here. Ah, the Lord. He brought me up. He picked me up. He dusted me off. He saved me. And the Lord made me somebody. Tell your neighbor, move over while I make my boast in the Lord. Give me some room while I glory. Not in my accomplishments. While I glory. Not in my pedigree. While I glory. Not in my name. But let me glory in the Lord. Yes, Lord. Say I. Say I. Ah! Upper room, praise him if you know what I'm talking about. You ought to shake somebody's hand and tell them I'm just glad. I'm just glad to be saved. I'm glad that Jesus looked down on me. I'm glad that the Lord thought enough of me to save me. I couldn't join the country club. I couldn't join the glee club. I couldn't join certain organizations, but when I heard about the Lord, hey, 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 he looked at me, he looked at me, he looked at me and said, son, you're mine. I'll take you. I'll take you. So, I'm glad to serve in the church. I'm glad to be born again because I'm one of the foolish, one of the weak, one of the base, one of the despised, and one of the things that be not, the nothing people, the nothing. Some of us are name droppers. We love to drop names. We like for people to know that we know. You know what you'd be better off doing? Learning, learn to just be satisfied being nothing. Because God chooses the nothings. He doesn't, he doesn't, he skips the name droppers. Hallelujah. He looks over them. He looks over them. Amen. I guess it's just, it's got to be the devil today. I, Rick, you need to be down here helping me out. Say, amen. But I ain't going to let it bother me. Y'all, can y'all hear me? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Jeremiah, when he said, let him that glory, glory in the Lord. The word glory there means trust. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 9, right. verse 23 says, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he knoweth and understandeth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, righteousness, and judgment in the earth. It says, don't trust. If the Lord has given you money, good. But don't trust it. If the Lord has given you a wonderful education, good, but don't trust it. If the Lord, hallelujah, has given you influence, good, but don't trust him. Don't glory in your connections. Don't, don't put all of your weight on the fact that you, uh, you're on the inside. 
whatever that means. You know, that there are people, oh, it just matters so much to them to be on the in crowd. You know, I got, honey child, I got to be in the know myself. No, it's not whether or not you're in the know. It's who you know. Whether or not you know the Lord. That's the, that's the thing. But he takes, he takes people, he takes people like this, and, and he raises people up. Um, the deal is, though, as you rise, Brother Wright, you preached it. Don't get too big for your britches. As you rise, don't forget where you come from and who brought you. See, as, as he uses you to confound the wise, stay humble. As you go into circles and, and business and you outdo those who on paper should run rings around you. And the Lord blesses you. That's wonderful. He says, but the way I want you to do is you stay humble. Amen. As, as I give you things, nothing wrong with having things, but after I give you things, stay hung, hungry for me. See, don't you let God's blessings cause you to lose your hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, Lord bless you with a new home, then you stop coming to church. You'd have been better off uh, uh, homeless. Because when you, when you were trying to get one, you stayed on the altar. I liked you better, homeless. You, you danced when you were homeless. See, you, you, you had a praise, homeless. Then when the Lord gave you a, gave you a home, uh, as soon as you got the car, when you were catching a ride, you made every service. Now that you have your own car, we see you once a month. That means your, your trust have gone from the Lord to that area, to that car, or to that area of achievement. And you were better off struggling. I know that the only thing I have going for me is the Lord. I know that the only one who deserves the praise is the Lord. Amen. So we're inspired <clears throat> to serve him more. And To recognize what a privilege it is to be saved. For some, you have forgotten your privilege. And the Lord told me to tell you, come to the altar and tell him thank you. Thank you for saving me. God, I let life uh, cause me to forget just how fortunate I am to be in you. I lost sight of that, Lord. I lost sight of that. But Lord, I am blessed. And I'm blessed indeed to be in you. If the Lord is talking to you, come to the altar. Lord, I lost my fire for preaching. I want my fire back. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Hallelujah.